I am joined today by Dr. Corey Steiner, superintendent of the Northern Cass School District in the rural Hunter, North Dakota area. Northern Cass was a 2022 finalist for the prestigious YAS Prize for Education Innovation, particularly for its unique strategy for reaching rural students in a more personalized way. Corey Steiner, welcome to the Liberated Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I'm so glad that you're here. You know, I'm, I'm going to be up front and say that you are the only person I've interviewed on this podcast who works within the traditional school system. Mm -hmm. My show is primarily focused on the entrepreneurial parents and teachers who are building alternatives to conventional K-12 mm -hmm. schooling. But I'm told that you are doing something really unconventional at Northern Cass and really kind of innovating and trying to be as out of the box as possible. So I'm so delighted to have you on the podcast. And I'd love to hear, you know, what makes your school district so special? What are you doing? Um, well, so uh, I think there's a few things that make us special and different. And, and what we like to think of as one of the truly innovative public school districts in the country. Um, we realize like when you have more information, you know, when you know better, you should do better. And we had information that was saying our kids that didn't go to college, people were looking at them like they were failures, or if they went to a two-year school, school, they were looking like failures. And we just couldn't reconcile that. We just said that doesn't make sense. So we tried to shift to a model of being choice ready. So college, career, military. And I tell parents, I don't care which one. I just want kids to have enough experiences to know what they don't want to do when they leave here, because we shouldn't expect an 18 year old to have a crystal clear picture of what they're going to do the rest of their life. That's just not the world we live in. And so to do that, uh, we had to make a conscious decision. We were a school that was sending over 90 percent of our kids to four year college. By all metrics, we were doing exceptionally well. And we said, if we do this, if we're going to do truly what's right by kids and become truly learner centered, we got to tear this thing down and start all over. Um, that was that was scary. And then it's been five years of really hard work, of really beautiful work and fulfilling work um, to create a system that's personalized for every learner and it's competency based. So we're a district without percentage or letter grades all the way up through the senior year. Uh, and we did that because we knew the focus needed to be on learning instead of obtaining a, a grade that honestly, I don't know what a 92 percent means. I've been in this gig for 25 years. I still don't know what that means. And so we decided that we said, what if we could build agency in kids and give them more freedom of choice in how they learn and how they demonstrate their learning? Um, and so we started doing that through our learning management system, giving kids the ability to own their learning, to understand what's best for their learning in real time, to coach them when they make mistakes because they're kids and they're going to make a bunch of mistakes. But in our old system, mistakes were punishment. Now, mistakes are learning opportunities. And so we've created this model where you're seeing learners work at their own pace and the teacher has taken on the role of a facilitator. They do a lot more coaching and conferencing with kids than we ever do where we'll do whole group things. Um, and when it gets up into the high school, the model that really we love, we have a couple different things going on middle and high school called the studio experience. The studio experience is co-designed with learners and educators. The learners decide what they're going to learn. They design the experience and the educators work right beside them, helping to facilitate that process. And then when they get up into high school, that becomes a very independent process. We have probably 14 or 15 kids that have decided to take an alternative pathway to graduation based on competencies fully instead of any traditional standards. Um, we've got a lot of dual credit or early college courses, but we also have kids in internships outside the building all the time and we have written for waivers from our state so anything a kid does outside the building can be articulated for credit inside the building um, and so we've taken advantage of every piece of legislation to get rid of seat time uh, and to reimagine an educational experience that can look like the models you're talking about because honestly that's what i want us to look like is look like something that's never been done but do it within the scheme of a k-12 district so that's a lot. <laughs> well, I'm so impressed. Uh, it sounds like you're doing some really great things. I, I want to get into a little more of the details in a minute, but maybe we could back up and, and you could share some more uh, information about the district. It's a rural yeah. area. Uh, tell us about your demographics, kind of what is that uh, area like? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because I, I did go over that. Uh, if you looked outside my window to the right, what you would see is we are surrounded by four sides of cornfields. We do not have a town that we're part of. We are a consolidated district where they put the school in the middle of the district in the middle of farmland. We serve about 700 learners pre-K through 12. We're all in one building, um, growing like crazy. 35% of our kids come from outside the district. Uh, and jump on the bus sometimes for an hour and a half to get out to here because we tell them you're going to get a big school opportunity, but you're going to get in in a small school environment. Uh, we're we're not very diverse ethnicity wise. Uh, we're about 98% white, but when it comes to poverty, we have a fairly significant growth in our poverty levels and our special education levels. Um, and, and I think the the part that is important to understand is all six of the communities we serve. There's not one essential service in any of them. Um, they are small communities. One's 350, some are 50, most are under 200. Um, and if there's not an agricultural business in there, there's not very much that's happening in those areas. So we, we're very unique when we say isolated and rural, we're the epitome of that. Yeah. And you said that it's growing like crazy population wise. What is driving that? Uh, you know, I'll say the population of the school is growing like crazy, not, not out in our areas because there's just no housing out here. Um, but I, I think the reason it's growing is, is we have a very strong reputation of trying things and doing things differently. And I think it's also the idea that a parent can come out and say like, hey, my kid doesn't like, you know, social studies, so I'd like to see him do it differently. And we create a culture of yes in this building. So if they say that, I won't say, well, no, they have to take that. That's the state rule. We'll say, all right, let's sit down and figure out a plan. Let me get my director of personalized learning. Let's figure out what we can do different with your learner if they don't like that, still learning it, but learning it in a way that's applicable to them. And I think people appreciate the fact that we're very flexible in our approach. Uh, again, that's that's what the choice, you know, the choices that other people are doing out there. And I've gotten to know through the ASK prizes, they're just good at giving kids choices and then helping them work through those. Hmm. So you said that this started, this process of transformation really started about five years ago. I wonder if you can share a little bit about the origins of that. You know, how did this idea come to be? What was happening there? What was the kind of feedback to this uh, transformational vision? I'd love to hear what yeah. things were like back in the uh, beginning. Senate Bill 2186 was passed by the North Dakota legislature. And in that, it said the superintendent of public instruction could waive certain things in code. And so we said, well, we're going to go against Century Code and we're going to say no seat time. And so we created the JAG Academy, which was an online virtual learning experience for kids where they'd spend half their day in there. And then they picked the courses that they wanted to be in that they were really passionate about. First year, we had 35 kids, really successful, a bunch of kids that got through eighth grade and half a year and started freshman level courses. Um, we thought pace was everything and the most important thing. Um, the next year we got back and we had 10 kids that returned. Um, the following year, we had eight. Um, what we realized quickly in this was pace is a four-letter word. It's important, but it is not the thing that should guide any transformation. Um, it should be considered in the transformation. We were so worried about going faster that we took away the thing that's probably most powerful here, and that was the relationships with educators. And so what happened is we sat down and we said two things. Do we like like what we were trying to do? And everybody said, yeah, we love the idea. So then why wouldn't we do it with every kid? If it's supposed to be good for every kid, why wouldn't we do it with the whole system? And so we went out to our community and, and this is what I did. Uh, I met with them and I asked one question. I said, tell me what your hopes and dreams are for your child. And, you know, nobody said they need to be the highest GPA. They need to be valedictorian. They have to get in Harvard. Like everybody said, geez, I just want my kid to be happy, to be fulfilled to live a life, be a good human being. And I told him, I have to be honest with you, I'm not sure we can do any of those things in our current model because our, the model right now doesn't allow us to work with your kids just as human beings. It makes us work with them as a number. And so I said, can you trust us that if we do this, it will be messy and it will be tough, but the end goal will be something very beautiful where learners are able to write a story that when they're 30 years old, they're just gonna be remarkable human beings. And they put the trust in us to do that. Uh, the grading thing, man, that, that was the toughest time I've ever been in in my career. People were furious with us because they were worried about loss of scholarships and it always worked for me. Why are you changing this? But 
over the course of the five years and us staying the course and being very transparent when we make mistakes and talking to parents and really, really talking to our kids. But here's what we did different than most people did. We listened. When they said it didn't work, we quit doing it. When they said the policy for them, this didn't make sense, we let them build a new policy. And, and so all this, getting all these groups involved, helped us over the last five years shift to this really, really amazing system that still has a long ways to go. Um, but I will say we chose to be brave before perfect because this is what kids needed and this is what kids deserved. It's just really amazing. You know, there's other states that have uh, these innovative school bills and legislation that allows for exemptions and encourages experimentation. Um, but it seems like you're the ones who've really taken full advantage of that. Uh, and certainly you're the only school district that was a YAS finalist. Um, so what is preventing other innovators, uh, entrepreneurial educators like you and others in your team um, from doing what you've done in places where it is legislatively possible to do that? What do you think? Uh, again, there's a few things. One is it's hard. Like this is this is hard work. I mean, we, we went through a period and this sounds crazy, but we went through this significant period of grief that like we actually were talking to grief counselors of how to work through because people had lost this part of themselves. This is how I taught for 15 years and they were good at it. In a traditional model, they were amazing. And now we had to reinvent every one of us, the leaders, the paras, everybody had to reinvent who we were. So it's hard, but we also have to understand something being hard isn't evidence, it's wrong. So one was it's really hard work. Two, I, I believe, and I think you probably know this nationally, there are a lot of things people blame or say they can't do because of policies that don't exist. I, I hear that a lot when I travel the country of like, well, we can't do that. I'll say, are you sure? Oh, no, not really. But we've just never, they need to ask. They're typically, the regulations in some states is, is quite forgiving uh, and actually would encourage innovation if we really wanted to take notice of what they are. And then I think the last thing is, is um, we're, we're still operating on this model of what success looks like. And we still think that's about a four-year college. And because of that, if you get kids into four-year college and you get them to graduate high school, we believe we're doing something that's right for kids. Um, and I say they're getting into four-year colleges and graduating high school despite what we're doing wrong to them. So I just think it's, it's hard work, but it's the only work. Like that's got to be the narrative. It's the only work we should be doing. I love that you you push back against other educational leaders who say, we'd love to do that, but we can't. And you say, why not? And, and really uh, push them to think about what they could do differently. So you talked about, you know, personalized learning and, you know, very kind of interest driven learning, especially uh, in the high school ages. What does that look like in practice? Are we talking about technology and sort of an online platform for students? Or is it really a blend of online and in-person interaction? I'd love to hear more of the specifics there. Yeah. So um, our studio model, which is what you're referencing in level six through eight, we just reset our middle school to really build it around a learner-centered approach. Um, they're, after, they're morning our core, their afternoons are peer studio, six-week experiences that they co-design with their educators. Um, that is more driven by the relationship and driven by in-person. Um, the tech plays a role to supplement it, but it, they're not doing a course on a device. They are using that device to share out and connect with experts outside the community, to bring experts into the community, and then have some type of contributing impact on the community that they push out. So it's really about an end um, at the high school because it's exceptionally independent where, you know, these kids are doing this as part of their course requirements. Um, some will choose to do some online pieces, um, but it's only choice. I will tell you that we have really tried to keep the tech on the side. And when it is best for learning, we use it like crazy and leverage it like crazy. But we're, we're really about the relationship and how does that relationship not even, how not only help the learner grow, but also help the educator grow. Um, and the, you would see our facilitators when a kid says, well, I think I want to learn about this. They don't say, OK, here's the five things you need to know. They'll say, tell me more. And, and the kids will get tired. They'll be like, stop saying, tell me more. 
because then they'll finally get to the point like, oh, I want to start digging into that. So like right now, I have a young lady who's writing a graphic novel and doing all the artwork on women in history. She didn't want to take a world history course because she said nobody looks like me in the history books. She's right. So she's going to develop a course that kids could take down the road. Like that's very meaningful. The tech will play a role towards the outcome, but it's never the main strategy for us in terms of building knowledge. That's really interesting because I think often when we hear personalized learning, we think about online and certainly there's tremendous uh, potential with technology and opportunity for individualized learning. But it's great to hear that you really uh, are retaining uh, that in-person relationship uh, and that community of learners. So, you know, one thing I often say is that our our traditional standardized system of schooling um, often crushes teacher creativity as much as it crushes learner creativity. And so I'm curious now, five years into this, what are you hearing from your teachers? Are they feeling more empowered as just as the learners are? Or what is that like? Um, they, they would tell you that they have autonomy and the ability to make choices in their learning center and know that if they make a mistake with it, it's a learning experience. Like we, we really do beat on this idea of a culture of yes, uh, when somebody comes and says, I want to try something crazy, I don't say, oh, man, I wonder what the response were like, yes, how can we do that? What do you need from me? What can we do to make that work? And I've seen like th this, the beautiful creative things that are created now because they don't feel tied down to like, oh, we have to get to page 185 in the textbook. Now they're now they're when a kid says, boy, I really want to learn more on this. They let them they let them dig in or they say, let's figure out a way for us to dig deeper. And it really seems like you guys love this. Um, I think it's been freeing. They'll tell you it's hard work. Like they will. They, I mean, if, if I had a teacher beside me, they'll say this is not an easy place to work. The expectations are high. The workload is significant. Um, but I'd also think they would tell you uh, to a fault that they would not go elsewhere into a traditional system because they're afraid of putting that basil in front of them. I'm dating myself. That basil in front of them and reading through or that script in front of them. They don't want that. They want to be able to make professional decisions and use their professional judgment in a way that benefits themselves and kids. Oh, it's really great, you know, because I talk to um, former public school teachers who've left the system because they do feel like it's too standardized and that they don't have that kind of creativity and autonomy. And so they go off and build something different. Um, so it's wonderful to hear that you are proving that this can happen within a traditional system and that teachers can be really satisfied and fulfilled in the same way that their students are. So my optimism is growing, Corey, <laughs> that this is possible within the traditional system, but I'm still slightly cynical because history often shows us that school districts will, for a time, uh, innovate, right? I think about the open classrooms movement of the 1960s mm -hmm. and in sort of other sort of educational trends that seemed so promising that really did provide more op uh, opportunity and autonomy for teachers and students. And then ultimately get sort of reabsorbed into the dominant traditional system. Is that a worry for you? It, that is an extreme worry because I think that's what happens. Like, I, I don't think you know, sometimes public schools get a bad, a bad, you know, feeling about them that they're not going to, they never try anything innovative. And I, I don't think that's true. I think there's a lot of innovative districts. It's their ability to stay with it through changes that occur with teachers, with admin, with school boards. Um, so you really have to build it into your strategic plan. It's got to be who you are. You know, so like if I decide to leave here, it, it shouldn't go with me. It's got to be built into the system. And you do that by letting people lead from where they're at. You let the teachers lead from where they're at. You let your directors, your principals. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's probably the biggest thing you see is people are like, yeah, we were doing that like five years ago. It worked really well. But then we had a change in leadership and they didn't really like it. Somehow you have to make this be who you are. You know, when people say Northern Cast, they're like, oh, personalized learning district. That's who we are. That, I don't believe that will ever change Um for the, the dawn of time. I just think that will be there forever. Um, but how you do that in some places when they see so much change in people, that's not easy. I mean, we're lucky. We have a lot of our people that return every year. That helps us continue to build instead of have to restart all the time. 
Yeah. And I think you're really creating a model that's truly competitive with some of these um, unconventional out of system models that I certainly focus on micro schools and hybrid homeschooling and learning pods and all kinds of uh, innovative K to 12 models outside of the system. You're showing that it can happen in the system in a meaningful way, um, which is wonderful for being able to sort of compete for students in that way. I wonder if you've been able to influence others then in being this leader in certainly the the uh, exposure that you've gotten through the YAS Prize. Um, are others trying to follow in your footsteps? Um, you know, I, I would never say follow in our footsteps because we found really quickly when we were doing this work, like when you'd go to a site visit, you're like, oh, I want to do what they're doing. And then you'd go and you try to put that into your system. And you're like, it doesn't work because every system is just like every learner. It's a different. Um, so what we've tried to do is can we get people to have the mindset to start thinking about doing things differently and then to pick like one thing. You don't have to go system wide. We made that choice system wide. But to one thing like, hey, we're going to take this little piece. We're going to give kids a lot of ownership in this course and we're going to build that out. And then if that works, well, we're going to extend it. Um, I think that's a very doable model. I mean, we do have some other districts, West Fargo, Oaks, YCC, that are moving towards personally competency based learning. They've been involved with us in Knowledge Works in uh, five year professional learning to move our districts forward. You know, when I talk to other districts in, in the state, they, they love the idea. We have tons of people come visit. Um, it, it's we host a personalized learning institute in the summer. We we get about 300 people from 15 to 20 states that come from around the country. And what we tell them is it doesn't matter if you're a system leader or if you're an individual classroom educator, you're going to walk away with strategies to meet your kids exactly where they're at and just try one thing. I think if we could get people just to try one thing, uh, ultimately what happened with us is the kids told us this is what they wanted after a while. And now they push back. When it's not enough personalization, they tell us. Um, I have a learner advisory council and they will say, it's not enough in this class. Like we need more. Uh, we have a learner board member who will sit down with me and say, this has to change. And like, I appreciate that. I don't look at that as a bad thing. I think that that's the kind of feedback we've been missing in public schools for a long time is the voice of our learners and the voice of our parents. And our parents tell us when we're not doing enough to personalize now as well. So you're certainly speaking my language. Of course, I'm very much focused on learner-centered, uh, learner-directed education, but I wonder what kind of resistance you might get, uh, especially maybe from the community who might want a more traditional, more conventional look. Do you ever encounter that kind of criticism? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Especially when you when you survey out, we'll get a lot of people that say, stop using the term educator and stop using the term learner. Just go back to the way it was. It was fine. Uh, and and what I always tell people is, is, you know, what the world was a year ago is different than what it is now. And even tomorrow will be different. Um, if we don't create systems that are agile and the traditional system has proven for 150 some years to be completely and totally immobile at times, that like we're going to lose a generation of kids. Like it, we're blaming kids. Everybody does like they're on their phones too much. There are video games too much. Oh, they get into the workforce and they don't want to work. Well, at what point do we look at the system that created that and say, maybe the system is killing kids' ability and willingness to be a different type of human being. Uh, so I just, I just, I just don't buy into this notion that kids are the problem. So when people tell me, I listen, and then I'll say, here, look at, and I'll give them examples of the things our kids have done. And it's, it's tough to argue. It's really tough. Uh, our, our seniors end the year with a capstone event. Um, and the first few years we did, it was terrible. I mean, it was a kid getting up and he would be like, I was in basketball. Basketball was fun. I'm a leader. And you're like, oh, my Lord, what are we doing? The last two years have been the most, the best days of my entire career. Kids get up and they just tell stories about how they developed our portrait of a learner's skills and how the school has helped them become the person they want to be and the person they want to be in the future. Amazing days. When parents sit in there, nobody questions what we've done. There, I've never had anyone walk out after that. And I've had some people that are resistors that will walk out and say, I get it. I see it. That's not something my kid could have done five years ago. So just give them a chance. Let kids be kids. They'll surprise you at how amazing they are. Absolutely. 
So Corey, how did you become such an education revolutionary? You know, how <laughs> did you um, come to this work? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've just worked with really good people. Uh, my superintendent in high school and somebody I worked with later as my first principal job just always said, you're going to have tough days. People are going to be mad at you. You're going to make decisions that aren't popular. You're going to be wrong. But he goes, if you put kids at the center, that is always going to help you sleep at night. Um, and then over the course of the years, I've always, my mentality has always been when people say we can't do that because I said, well, what if we could? Like, what, what would happen if we could do that? Or if they said, this is what's going to happen. They said, but what if it didn't? And I've just had the mentality of like, let's try to create a system, a world-class system of education, like within the system and the within the cards were dealt. Um, when I, when I got uh, interviewed out here nine years ago, they said, what's your goal for Northern Cast? And I said, in five years, the entire country will know about it still in the middle of the cornfield. And I remember they laughed. Um, and this isn't a me, this is the us. I said, people aren't laughing now, they're listening. Um, and it's because we have this like ridiculously dedicated group of educators, a community that trusts us when we make major changes and learners that are as gifted as any group of learners that have ever walked into our school. Uh, the tran transformation is about everyone. So some people will say, well, look what you've done. I haven't done anything. I've, al I've allowed people to do the things that they were always meant to be able to do. I've just gotten out of their way. And when I've had to get in and help, I do it because that's when they're asking for my help as a leader. So you've created this uh, impressive template for uh, how school districts can innovate from within and really prioritize learner-centered um, self-directed education. Are you optimistic for the future of traditional schooling in this country? Or I guess, what is your sense of what that will look like? That's a, that's a great question. Um, uh, it's, it's a tough question too. So I'm gonna say it two ways. I'm optimistic that there is optimism to be had. I'm pessimistic because I'm worried that the narrative on education and not just public schools, is tearing people's willingness down to want to be able to do this work and change the world. I feel like people people feel as if they're not making a difference anymore. And I don't care if that's probably a bit public, charter, micro, that part has to, we have to figure that out. Here's what I'm really optimistic about. As part of the YAS Prize, I knew hard, North Dakota is a non-charter state. I knew very little about charters other than a few I had visited. I didn't know much about micro schools, again, instead of some I worked with these people, and again, we were the, the one public school district to be a finalist, only two in the semifinals. Uh, and so this whole time we were talking school choice, school choice, and I was like, well, I'm, like, I'm maybe not the right person to be here. But what I found out is when I listened, what I found is all they wanted to do was what's right for kids. Like, that was it. And so I was like, oh, this, this isn't a us versus them. This is, this is us with each other helping us. So the optimistic part is, I think in our state where they, they voted down a voucher bill this last year, but I believe it will come back next time. And I think it will pass. I think we have an amazing opportunity with the public and private and all the groups that are to sit down at the table and say, what could we do to make education better for every kid and not compete, but work together to make sure every kid gets exactly what they need. Like, I think we have an opportunity before us. I'm optimistic about the opportunity. I hope, I hope people will get out of the way and let the educators who know how to do it put this plan together. That's what I'm hopeful for. Well, you have certainly helped to whittle away some of my skepticism around meaningful systemic change within the traditional system. So uh, congratulations for all of your great work and success. How can my listeners and viewers learn more about Northern CAS and your work and follow you? Yeah. If, uh, so Twitter's at Corey Steiner, then the number 10. Um, and then if they go to northerncastschool.org, it's it's a mouthful. Um, we have a personalized learning site on there. You'll see a bunch of the different videos, the things we've done. Um, you'll also see about our personalized learning institute. It's um, $125. And, and I can honestly say, like, we have three of the biggest speakers in the country that are coming for this. So this is not uh, it's this is not your normal conference. And then every breakout is led by educators who are doing the work. Um, so any of that, you can find out a lot about us and what we've done. We're not perfect, 
but we're brave and we'll always stand. Uh, we'll stand on a hill for that forever. Brave you are uh, and best wishes in your work. Dr. Corey Steiner, thank you again for being on the Liberated podcast. Thank you, Carrie. I really appreciate you having and sharing our story.